Hi, I'm Jim Woodworth. I'm from a company called Clear to Pay, and I'm going to be not repeating, but hopefully reinforcing and fleshing out the great presentation that Richard just did. So, presentation about um, payment services hubs. The agenda is going to be as follows What is a payment services hub? If you ask 10 different people, you get 11 different definitions. Um, Clear to Pay, our company, and our history with payment services hubs. Um, issues in card processing, um, how to address those issues with payment services hub, um, a case study of a very large bank who have implemented a payment services hub approach to address their problems in cards. So don't think that payment services hubs are just a theoretical um, phenomenon, they're also very practical as well. And then implementation lessons, which we might discuss if people are still awake at the end of this. So let's go. What is a payment services hub? The, the, uh, the interest in the cards business and payment services hubs, I think, came from Gartner Group and particularly Kristen Moyer, who came out with this, uh, this statement a couple of years ago. Anybody who's looking to refresh their card payment technology should be looking at payment services hubs. And particularly in light of, um, as Richard said, the sunset of various products, people are looking at maybe a replacement, a like-for-like -like replacement of their existing infrastructure. Kirsten says, don't do that. Look instead at a different approach, which is the payment services hub approach. Um, so what is a payment services hub? This is um, Salent, who are a very reputable analyst's definition. It's not one I particularly agree with because I think it gives the impression that a payment services hub is one big lump of software where transactions somehow co go in, somehow they're processed, and somehow they go out. So whether that transaction is a card ATM withdrawal or an international SWIFT payment, I don't believe that one lump, monolithic lump of software is ever going to solve your payment problems. My preference is to say an SOA, uh, sorry, a payment services hub, it's a concept, it's a vision, it's a technology path, it's certainly an SOA strategy, it's a path to agility and cost effectiveness, it's a work in progress, we're never going to get there, but we ought to start the journey. But my favorite is it's an organizational paradigm change. What I mean by that is um, I could ask people in the audience, are you responsible for cards payments? Are you responsible for payments? Because if you go to an organization, and I've been in the cards business for 25 years, typically I talk to cards people. And when I say, what's the value of a payment services hub? They say, there is no value to me in a payment services hub. I have a cards business to run. I have card issues to solve. The higher up in the organization you go and you talk to a CIO or a CTO, they say, I have a payments business to run. Authorization is the same in cards as it is in doing a direct debit. Authentication shares a lot of similarities as well. Clearing, settlements, analytics, marketing, they all are part of my payments business. So if anybody from my cards line of business comes and says they want investment, I'm saying, can we lower the cost of that investment by sharing it among other payment types? So it's a different way that an organization looks at solving the investment problems, the cost problems that they have in their businesses. So an organizational paradigm change where you look at payments holistically rather than as separate lines of business is, I think, a very good way of looking at the power of payment services hubs. We had a customer roundtable in Amsterdam this month, a couple of weeks ago, where the CIOs and CTOs of a number of large European banks came to discuss this problem. Are card payments the same? Are they different or are they unique? And we had a very big debate. And again, interesting, some people said card payments are the same. Some people said no. It's the same as any other type of payment. Some, everybody had a different view. So are car payments the same as other types of payments? The, the more senior the people in the organization were, the more they said a car payment is essentially the same as any other payments. 
it, it gets originated somehow, it gets authorized, it gets authenticated, it gets cleared, it gets settled. There's links with analytics, there's links in marketing, there's links to the general ledger system. They said car payments are the same. However, other people pragmatically said, well, the functions are the same, but they're slightly different. So clearing in cards is not the same as clearing um, international payments, for instance. A lot of the functions are the same, but they're, they're slightly different. And other people said, well, actually, car payments are unique. Only car payments are generally carried out under global brands. Car payments are ubiquitous. You can do a visa payment in Singapore. You can do a visa payment in New York. You're operating under global brands. That's not the same as a SWIFT payment, which is not a well-known consumer brand. It's not the same as a domestic ACH. So there were views. However, I have to say the majority of people in the audience did feel that the similar similarities in car payments to other types of payments were greater than the differences or the uniques. We then showed a typical card transaction. A number of these people were more specialists in wholesale banking or ACH. And they said, yep, we recognize acquisition. We call it origination. We recognize the authentication of the origination. That you know, if you're doing a corporate payment, we want to authenticate the person who's making that payment. Yeah, we, there's fraud control that takes place in all types of payments. Routing takes place in all types of payments. Journaling. And then the, the whoops. And then the, uh, the connection between the settlements with the merchants, the cardholders, the schemes, and then the other types of system, the other types of systems in the bank are the same as all types of payments. So after all that, I hope you'll allow me to make the assertion that a card payment is not that different from other types of payments. And if it's not that different, if there's lots of similarities, then why with the, CIO, the CIO would say, why are we making huge investments in cards, huge investments in ACH, huge investments in international payments, when actually a lot of the functions are all the same, and I seem to be tripling my investments in payments when I, I needn't. So is there a solution to this? And this is where card payment hubs come in. Um, just to give you a, a bit of indication about the company I work for, clear to pay we have a background in payment services hubs the last five years or so. Um, we've won numerous awards from the major analysts for our card payment hub technology. Um, and recently, a couple of years ago, if I can just point you down there. So Gartner Group said the recent acquisition of our open card system software with our proven payment services hub software makes clear to pay a very powerful proposition. And just look at our our, our blue chip customer base. Jeez. Remind me not to step in front of the speakers again. Um, so we, we have a, a large number of, um, of blue chip customers, most of whom are using, uh, are using uh, car payment hub technology. So what are the issues in car payments processing? Again, at the round table we ran with our CIO, CTO type customers. We said, what are the issues that you are facing in cards processing? And these were the main ones that came out. First of all, there seems to be a continuation of a global financial crisis. And every CIO said, we're not getting the investment money that uh, we'd like to have. Money is very tight in banking. Um, we're getting really squeezed on our interchange fees. So in the EU, there's a lot of uh, competition regulation from... Uh, from the competition authorities in the States. The, uh, the Durbin has really squeezed debit change interchange in Australia. Now in Canada, interchange rates are getting squeezed. So the revenue in the cards business is going down. Um, there's increasing transaction volumes, which means increased investments in hardware. However, those values, the values of transactions are going down. So even though we have to increase our costs, we can't necessarily have a commensurate increase in our revenues. And we're using proprietary hardware and software all the time, and that is expensive. The other issue that came up was complexity. 
um, particularly banks who've engaged in M&A over the last 10 years or so say, I'm running multiple credit systems, multiple debit systems. I'm in three or four countries. Instead of having one card system to process the lots, I've got seven or eight, and it's really hurting me. Why is it hurting me? Because every time Visa come out with a mandate, instead of doing it once, I have to do it eight times, and it's really expensive. I'm also running old in-house systems, either sunsetted vendor technology or old IBM machine code, and I have the DRR problem. Do you, do you know what the DRR problem is? No, everybody I've got to understand my system is either dead, retired, or redundant. So I have a payment system that nobody understands. And uh, I'll give you, uh, this, this is a great example. Did you ever used to work for Lloyds, Richard? Nat West, okay. Lloyds Bank have got a system where they actually, halfway through the processing of a payment, they translate it from uh, pounds to pounds, shillings, and pence. And then further on, they retranslate it into uh, pounds and new pennies. Britain went decimal in 1971, and yet part of their crucial payment system has a pounds, shillings, and pence old currency function in it. And they haven't been able to change it for 41 years. There's nobody around who understands that system. They're terrified of touching it. So that's the type of the complexity that a lot of banks have got to face. And the other issue is governance. Right? How do you govern your payment systems? And particularly with the rise of things, hybrid, what I've called hybrid systems. In the UK, there's a system called Faster Payments where you can do immediate credit transfers between me and you, and it takes, uh, often it takes 10 seconds, but in any case, it should be less than, less than an hour. That system is a mixture of ACH and cards. It uses the infrastructure in the UK of the, the ACH, and it also uses the infrastructure of cards. It's basically credit transfers over ISO 8583. I was involved in a lot of the projects that we did to, to put UK faster payments in. And it, it actually covered a lot of the cards business, a lot of the ACH business, a lot of the, the, the treasury systems in banks as well. And, uh, sorry, a lot of the liquidity systems in banks as well. It's very hard to manage that type of project within a bank because it, it covers different lines of business in payments. And there aren't the... Uh, the, the governance structures in many banks to cover that. Now, that's just UK faster payments, but immediate payments is a, an extension of that. That's going worldwide at the moment. PayPal is an example of a system that uses both ACH and cards. Ideal in Holland, which again is um, tips to go uh, European-wide, is a system where you do um, card-like transactions over the internet, but the... Uh, the, the payment is made via your bank's internet banking system. And, and these are examples of hybrid payment types which are, are based on cards but cover other types of payment within the bank. And the governance in banks isn't di designed to deal with that. Neither are the systems designed to deal with that. The other issue we have is that mobile, every time we go to a customer, all we want to talk about is mobile. Every time I go to a conference, the last one I went to, the head of Visa, Peter Aliff, said, in 20 years, cards won't exist. Everything will be on a mobile phone. So there's, that might be an exaggeration or it might be, uh, it might be spot on. However, there's a, there's a realization that the existing systems that banks have are not designed to cope with the challenges that mobile face. And finally, uh, a big issue that Richard uh, touched on was the sunsetting of various products, and that's causing a lot of people to think, do we need to reinvest in our technologies? So the question is, we need to invest, we need to change, we need to modernize. The answer is, how? A payment services hub, we believe, addresses the issues in a number of ways. First of all, on the cost, by focusing on industry standard hardware and software, we reduce costs. By focusing on the commonalities across all payments, then we argue you can spread investments over all payment types rather than making card investments and then duplicating that with an ACH investment and then an international payment investment. So we believe by standardizing components that we've argued are the same across all payment types, we can make a substantial difference in cost. 
We can make a difference in complexity by aiming for a, a write once, run many type environment. We talked before about the cost of multiple um, mandate efforts that have to be made because you've got seven systems handling Visa when you really ought to have one. The, the adoption of a write once, run many approach, which is uh, emblematic of a, a payment services hub, can again reduce your costs and reduce the complexity. Um, adopting a payment services hub approach really enforces the need for you to look at payments as a whole rather than across lines of business types. So as hybrid payment systems like faster payments, like PayPal, like Ideal become more endemic in banks, then uh, a payment services hub approach where you look at payments as a whole rather than as individual payment types um, helps manage that approach. Um, the mobile approach where you will surround your legacy systems with mobile, again, is something that Payment Services Hub um, helps address. And finally, the, uh, the sunsets approach of old systems, right? Don't, don't build new functionality in old systems. Go with a Payment Services Hub approach and then gradually whittle away the old legacy environments until you have yourself a modern payments infrastructure. So this is entirely analogous to the, uh, the Payment Services Hub approach. Um, we'll look at a case study. Um, this is a, a large bank in Asia who um, went for a Payment Services Hub approach. Um, they started with a project to replace their 40-year-old core banking system. Their choice was to implement SAP banking. And when they did that, they realized that the uh, existing payment systems were hardwired into core banking. So you can't just replace core banking. You have to look at your payments infrastructure as well in this type of projects. Um, having been involved in a number of these projects myself, um, there is a huge difference between core banking and payments. One of the big differences is that core banking doesn't take any notice of the, the payment time scales that people like Visa and MasterCard impose on you. So typically, if you have an, an SAP or a Finical um, system, then the, the upgrades come once every 12 months or once every 18 months. That doesn't fit in with um, Visa's timescale, for instance. So it makes a lot of sense to have a payments, sorry, a core banking system and a payments layer above the core banking system as well. And that's certainly the approach that this bank went for as well. So at the same time as they were upgrading their core banking, they were upgrading their payment system as well. Um, a number of the payment methods were impacted, but one in particular was the cards. A lot of the cards, back-end payments, were hardwired into the core banking. Their existing card system was deemed not strategic, so they were looking to upgrade their, um, their card payment processing technology with a payment services hub approach. So the bank required a, a layer that would take the bank forward for all payment services types. Um, clear to pay was chosen as the uh, strategic platform for all forms of payments, not only cards, but also um, credit transfers, direct debits, international payments as well. Um, in time, the integration will be extended to other banks within the group. This is a, a multi a multi-region, a multinational global bank. Um, the initial implementation is in Asia Pacific and also other function areas within the bank as well, like analytics, like customer service. Um, the whole project has been documented by Tower Group. I really recommend reading the project because it's a lot of, a lot of analyst case studies I find are very, very theoretical. This is a very practical documentation by Tower Group, which looks at the whole project, looks at the personalities involved, looks at some of the hard choices that have to be made, and looks at the way that um, the banks resolve those choices. Um, at the end of it, the CIO is also on record as saying that he believes in payments, that his bank has got a three to five year advantage on their competitors. And he says the advantage comes from a number of areas, but in particular the fact that his cost base has been reduced dramatically by the reduction or the elimination of various multiple old payment types into one modern layer. 
and in particular, the ability to respond quickly to the needs of the market. If they need a new feature function in their car type, they can add it very, very quickly. It affects one layer rather than having to look at 10 different systems and work out the intricacies and the interconnections between them. So, as I say, he's on record as saying the bank has a three to five year advantage over the competitors. Um, what do they do? I've got a number of um, diagrams which I don't intend to go through in great detail, but I think they do demonstrate a, a number of things. First of all, that this, this layer handles cards processing. The first stage in the project was to handle the proprietary cards of the bank. And it was clear that these card payments could share a lot of the functionality with other payment types, and particularly the connections within the bank to other systems. So in this particular example, and this was the first stage of the project, then authorization, journaling, the links to customer services, the links to analytics, and the links to the fraud control were all carried out within this new layer. And they were sharing that particular infrastructure with other payment types, particularly ACH and, uh, sorry, uh, credit transfer and direct debit as well. The second phase of the project was using scheme cards. So these are the international cards, uh, I think the, yeah, the Visa and MasterCard. And in addition to the sharing of resources across analytics, customer service, authorization, authentication, journaling, etc., we also added clearing into the, mat, into the, the mix as well. So it, it is true that we found that there was probably more differences in clearing of uh, card transactions versus the other types of transactions. However, we, again, we share a lot of the functionality between clearing card transactions and clearing, um, clearing other types of payment types. So, Again, on the same infrastructure, we're doing the real-time um, elements of card and other payment type processing. We're doing the end-of-day batch elements of cards and other types of processing as well. Um, going back to what Selence was saying about a payment hub being something that handle all payment instruments, all payment types, etc., um, I said I disagreed with that. And one of the uh, lessons learnt from this uh, from, from this project was that there, there are needs for unique topologies for different payment types. And there is a requirement for, um, if you like, a service level agreement around availability for card payments, which isn't necessarily there in other payment types. It's not the end of the world if you lose your credit transfer system for 10 minutes. It's a problem, but it's not the end of the world. As we all know, it is the end of the world if you use your card, card system for 10 minutes. So we have a unique topology for a lot of the card payment processing. So we can use the same hardware components. We can use the same software components. We don't have to use the same system or, um, or setup for card payments as we do for other. We can still gain economies of uh, scale, economies of cost by, um, by running dedicated cards-based systems. The implementation lessons, um, some of them are, if you like, generic. Can I put these in one slide? These came out of the, uh, the Tower Group study. Um, so the governance of your payments is crucial to the success of a payment services hub project. You can't do payment services hubs unless your bank has an overall view of payments and not a siloed view like a cards view or a, an ACH view. So governance is crucial. Um, this is motherhood and apple pie, I accept. Assemble the right team, agree common language and clarify terminology, ensure the right mix of skills, ensure clarity of roles, etc. So set up your payment services project with experts from all payment areas, all function areas within the bank, and you will be on the path to success. As far as cards are concerned, though, right, don't go for a big bang approach. It's too complicated. Cards are very complex. It makes much more sense from a safety, a low risk migration point of view to implement payment services hubs in a smaller, multi phased approach. Um, each step of the, trans uh, the uh, transformation should have a distinct ROI benefit. In many cases, and we found this out with the, uh, the case study start with clearing and back office functions and ancillary functions first, 
authorization and interchange second. It's still the case in the bank, they're running their um, ATMs from their old legacy system. They might keep it that way for a, a number of years. But one of the, um, the lessons that we, that we gained from that, it's easier for a bank, if they want to make investments in card processing technology, to go for a payment services hub approach, because you're much more likely to get the investments that you need rather than going with just a cards-based approach. Let me, let me give a better example than, than that. If I'm head of the cards line of business and I want to achieve something, or I want to put a new product out, and it's cost me, going to cost me a million dollars worth of investments, I can go to my CIO and say, right, this is uh, going to cost me a million dollars. Can you do it? Can you do it quickly? And he might say yes or no. If you've already started on a PSH approach, and you say it's going to cost me a million dollars, but you can share the benefits of other payment types across the bank. There's a much more sympathetic approach, and the ROI becomes, a, in in some or many cases, a much better, a much better, much more, a much more done deal. So we found within the bank, it's documented to some degree in the tower study, but that doesn't really come out fully. That. It makes it easier to get investments if we have a PSH approach rather than if you're sticking with the old side of the approach where every investment you make has to go uniquely in the card system and can't be shared across other systems. So that's certainly one of the lessons that we drew. Um, the PSH benefits, this is a slide that's um, the same way you stole the sentence slide. I think I stole this from McKinsey. Um, the benefits of a payment services hub are cost reduction, revenue retention and enhancements, risk and liquidity management improvements, and increased agility. In the cars business, the two key ones, cost reduction. Because of the squeeze of revenues, cost reduction is absolutely key. Anything that can give you cost reduction is going to be looked upon sympathetically. That's what a payment services hub does. And second, increased agility. Our current card systems are so complex, it's hard to get new feature function to market quickly. That's what a PSH offers, increased agility. And finally, because Richard did a load of publicity material, I'll, do, I'll end on one. This is our company, Clear to Pay. We're a 1,000 people. We have 500 card specialists. And we are the recognized leaders in, car, sorry, in payment services hubs. The analysts recognize that. We're unique among our competitors in that we do have case studies of people moving the payment services hub approach to cards. And we think we've got a good story to tell, whether it's in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Australia, Brussels, London, New York, or my next stop, which hopefully is Monaco, but maybe not be. Anyway, thanks very much.